Uh, some of them are hard, yeah. But yeah. but with great responsibility comes great power. Hello, Jordan. This other is the recorder. Other, other way. <laughs> I always see things as a cycle, so one or the other. Like a dog chasing the tail. Is the dog chasing the tail or is the tail chasing the tail? It's something like the dog chasing the tail. The, the dog fence. Like, what? Uh, what? Do you have an exam today, Rachel? Huh? Do you have an exam today? I had a financial literacy. How was that? It went well. Thank you for oh man, it's gonna be hard. Are you gonna be able to see this, Jordan? We'll see. This is final clarification because I've asked other people, so we are all taking yep. these, <laughs> even if we like our grades. Right yep, because your my job is to make you prepared for the AP exam, okay. and I can't guarantee you that the AP exam is gonna skip the college week. That's you will really thank me in May when you have been. May. You'll thank me in May when you're like, oh yeah, remember that time I almost went from October to May without looking at ecology? I'm not taking the exam. Well, I will be on a beach drinking a... Probably. Something. Why? Because I'm going to the Bahamas, Ethan. We've been over this. No, we haven't. I feel like we have. Nope, this is news to me. <laughs> <laughs> so you're not here second semester? No. How am I supposed to teach you? I don't know. Well, that's a big... Yeah, you just forgot to Like, I don't know if I can teach you. No, you can't teach me. It's okay. No, no, I'm, I'm, I'm going to school next. I'm just going to take half a day to buy. Anyone else have life changing uh, surprises for me? <laughs> I feel like so this, I mentioned this. this is all right, let's get started because we all have places to be and things to do besides studying and thinking about school. This week shouldn't just be. 18 hours of school every day. That's how our brains get fired. Questions? Yeah. Do you have a question? No. Oh. Anyone have any questions? Uh, I don't really have anything specific. In regards to what? Anything. I am here not to give you things, but to just answer questions, go over things. How do primes work? I don't know enough information right now to answer that. But generally, they are like small snippets of genetic information that sort of manipulate protein production. They sort of like they act like viruses. Generally, Julia they Griffin to the front office, cells. please. Julia Griffin. Predominantly in the brain, so that's how disease is onto these. Um, I have. I, okay, I looked at the study guide thing on, yep. on my computer. Do you have a paper copy of that in here? Uh, that's another question I might not be able to answer. I might have had one that I threw away. Uh, yeah. Ah, trash paper. Ooh, Let's go over anything and everything. Go for it, Lily. Can you go over, like, carbon fixation? Yeah, okay. So, first thing is first, here's a leaf. It doesn't really look like a leaf, but we're going to imagine that. Well, we didn't go over it in great detail, the bottom predominantly of the leaves are these fixtures called stomata. And they let in our two inputs and outputs of photosynthesis. So CO2 goes in, oxygen goes out. Thank you, plants. Opening and regulating these stomata are two cells called guard cells. And guard cells close sort of like um, the door at the beginning of the Raiders of the Lost Ark. Um, when water pressure is low. And when the cell is experiencing water loss, the guard cells close, which means we can't get carbon in or out of cells. This is a story. This is going to cover your question. Why this matters is CO2 is built into two different reactions. We have our photosystems over here that absorb light and excite electrons, which make things like ATP and NADPH. There's 
those two energy carriers are going to go over to the Calvin cycle where CO2 gets incorporated into a molecule called, I believe, RUBP. You don't need to remember that. And that eventually will spit out a glucose molecule. The reason why we need ATP and NADPH, anyone want to help a friend out? Why do we need the ATP? ATP and NADPH for what? Why do we need it? Why do we need ATP and NADPH for the Calvin cycle, for oh, carbon fixation? Uh, just for the reasons. Mm -hmm. Well, I remember that uh, Calvin cycle uses ATP and NADPH. Bingo. Uses ADP and NADPH. Great. So we have these two things get not reduced. No, they, or they get oxidized. They get oxidized, and that energy and those electrons get used to make glucose. One, so endergonic. it's endergonic, bingo, and we call it anabolic, so we're building something up like Arnold Schwarzenegger. I was going to talk about how in Terminator 3, at the end of the movie, have any of you seen Terminator 3? Great movie, Skynet comes awake, which is the AI-based military machine, and they're fighting the Terminators in the Colorado last ditch resort base that the government has. Anyways, there's a door that slams down like that as well. Anyways, CO2 is fixated into the Calvin cycle using an enzyme called Rubisco. It's like disco. Um, Rubisco is funky because while it loves CO2, in low levels of CO2, it loves oxygen more, which means we do what process if our stomata closes? The stomata closes because the guard cells are losing water because it's very hot out or plants are dehydrated. What process occurs that isn't photosynthesis? It is the cellular respiration of plants that we call what? Those happen in plants that don't do this. Photorespiration. Photo Photo like there we go. <laughs> Photorespiration occurs when plants don't have enough CO2. Because they don't have enough CO2, we use oxygen in the Calvin cycle, which actually breaks down molecules of glucose. It doesn't build them up. So the plant is losing water and it's losing energy. When do you think maple trees do photorespiration? Yep. And this is why maple trees make a ton of extra glucose in the summer and fall, send it down to their roots, and then we tap into those reserves in March when it's sending the roots back up to the shoots. It's a really good time. Um, quickly, because I'm sure some of you might ask it. Cam, C4, both involve some type of separation. With Cam, it's temporal. So during the night, when it is cooler, less heat, Less water loss, we take in our CO2. We convert it into this molecule called CAM. And then that CAM is going to be broken down back into CO2 during the day. CAM is sort of like Venmo or PayPal, where there's two parties and there's an intermediary program to hold on to that CO2 for a little while. Basically making sure we absorb the CO2 and the stomatas are open. The stomatas are closed during the day, but we have the CO2 in there. Cam is a lot like a pasta party the night before a big workout or a race. We're storing the energy temporarily in our muscles to be used the next day. Ooh, I like that analogy. That works. C4 is the more confusing one, because why not? Um, we have 
the CO2 fixated into Pam in this crazy cell called the bundle sheet cell. I'm going to call it the VS cell. And it's really specialized because in this sort of protective cell, there's a high affinity for CO2. And then we take that and put it back into the mesophyll cell where again, CAM is broken back down into CO2 and we have the Calvin cycle occur. So this is spatial separation. This occurs during the day and the stomata are still open. CAM tends to happen more in, check your S's, deserts. Like, Cacti are, are cam plants where water loss has to be a hundred percent minimized. C4 are in biomes with maybe really high heat, but water loss isn't as important. We can still afford to lose some water by keeping our stomata open during the day. Um, I believe sugar cane is C4. Sugar cane grows in really hot tropical environments. Needs a lot of water, but it has a lot of water. So it can use, it can, it can survive the loss of water. Other questions? I will say, since I made the main exam today, I'm still working on ecology, there's an even split really between energy and cells and structure. So that means like roughly 50% of the multiple choice questions are gonna come from chapter six, seven, and eight, and nine. The other half is gonna be two through five. They're also organized so the MC will work in a section that's all about structure and function and then a, a section all about energy. So you can sort of like put your brain cap on each section and just only be thinking about that. Is this what they cover in like the advanced chemistry class? Oh man, okay, so let's see if I can do that in a second. There's a thing called an atom with varying amounts of electrons. Some of those can be radioactive because they have extra neutrons, which we use for radiometric dating and some levels of medicine. Um, because of the positive and negative charges, we can have three types of chemical bonds. We can have covalent, polar covalent, and ionic bonds. This is always going to be between a metal non-metal, which means that we're going to always have a positive and a negative charge molecule or region. A good example of this is your favorite kitchen addition, sodium chloride or table salt. Covalent bonds are just atoms sharing electrons. A good example of this would be my favorite greenhouse gas of all time. Methane, CH4, where there's an equal sharing of the two electrons between each hydrogen and the carbon. And polar covalent is water, or the upside down Mickey Mouse, because he's upside down, he's a tick. Um, Mickey Mouse is ticked, not because he's upside down, but because oxygen is really bad at sharing things. So the oxygen tends to be partially negative and the hydrogens tend to be partially positive. Yes. So is something more electronegative than anything with like a higher atomic mass? Is it not? Really Actually, it's the opposite. Electronegativity tends to be. Um, but um, yes. what we're learning about. This is chem, I always get this right, but like one mole of oxygen is heavier than one mole of hydrogen, right? Yeah, yeah. but weight doesn't have to do with it. The thing that determines electronegativity, um, electronegativity 
changes on the periodic table as you, um, it gets, uh, how do I want to say this? I'm like trying to be short. Um, the more valence electrons you have, the more greedy you are, the more electronegative you are. So oxygen has more to do. Bingo. But the bigger you are, the further away your electrons are from the nucleus, so your four bands decrease. So as you get bigger, it decreases, but as you have, have more valence electrons, it increases. So oxygen, <laughs> valence electrons in the outer shell. Because like oxygen only has two shells. If I go down to like gold, it has like five or six levels. Oh yeah, do the well model. No, I'm not gonna do the. Anyways, because <laughs> um, you guys are here to learn. Um, because of this, we can have hydrogen bonds occur between different um molecules of oxygen. The partial positive attracts partial negatives, and vice versa. Um, that's a good overview of most of chapter two. You could talk about the properties of water and their importance to life if you wanted to. You could talk about pH if you wanted to. Wait, so oh, second ago. The polar covalent bonds, they're not actually sharing the electrons. They are sharing the electrons. They they're sharing them unevenly. Yeah. Uh, so like Evelyn and, and I shared a dog and oh, I get it for a few hours a week. It's not really it's not really joint custody. And now I find out that my dog is going to the Bahamas, so I'm really stoked on that. Um, that's like an extreme polar covalent bond. Evan. So uh, there's one point that talks about calculating pH. Mm. Can we just use the method that they taught us in the GCAL? Does, does that work? They taught us it's like the negative log of I If you know, want to. I always would that work? Yeah. Um, I always go from like I always use the two equations, so pH plus pOH equals 14, so if I give you a pH of 4, pOH must be 10. 10. Anyone want to tell me if this is acidic or basic? Yeah, it's acidic. Basic. No, it's acidic. It's acidic. Neutral is basic. Up to 14 is Basic, and then a pH of one to seven is what we call acidic. What's the concentration of hydrogen ions? It's like it's like a large number. It could be like ten. Oh wait, so you know? Were you gonna ask like where it's higher? Well, it's so it's ten to the negative fourth. Or if you want to just think about moving your ones, to you start off with 1.0, which is a pH of 0, and then you go to a pH of 1, so it's 0 0.1, then 0 0.01, then 0 0.001, and then we get to 0 0.001, which is the same thing as 10 to the 4. So more hydrogen ions is more basic? Nope. No? <laughs> more... <laughs> Hydroxide ions more basic. Okay. This is where so the four makes you think small and weak. But the negative four. But what we are referring to with pH, this ten to the negative fourth means. Let me erase this. No, this is. We're always asking ourselves. For one hydrogen, or for one water molecule, what's the proportion to um, hydrogen? So if I had a one H2O to one H positive, I'm dealing with pure acid. That stuff is going to literally, I'm going to put it in my hand in, and I'm going to come out and I'll have no hand. That's really a sip. That's a, that's a pH of one. Um, so, or a, Wait, probably a zero, a pH of zero, but that doesn't exist. So a pH of four, which is one times 10 to the negative four, yeah. means that for every one water molecule, I have 0 0.0001 molecules of hydrogen. That's still pretty acidic. That's nearing lemon juice capacity. Uh -huh. 
a pH of 2, which is car battery acid, means that I'm going to move that up two decimals and it's going to be 0 0.01. You don't want to interact with car battery acid. That's a, not a good thing. So, so if I have 10 to the negative fourth, every molecule is lighter if there's 10 to the negative fourth per mole. It's a ratio. And the same thing is true for the other side. We have 1 times 10 to the negative 10th power for hydroxide. It's a lot less common. So it's sort of a ratio. Back. So why do acids break things down? Oh, because they're bees. They're pissed. They're pissed. Um, they're a positively charged nucleus without an electron. Because they have this positive charge, they need an electron to become stable. So they're, you know, um, you're all going to have relationships in your life, some good, some bad. And sometimes you're going to have this really great relationship that suddenly ends, and you need a rebound. And you just go out and you throw yourself at everything that moves or breathes to try and get emotional comfort from. And that's what hydrogen ions are. They are just looking for the extra electron to bring them stability. So they are corrosive, they are volatile, they're going to break things down. Not that ending relationships has to do any of those things, but you know, we all have our hearts broken many times in our life, good or bad. And it might not even be a person, it might be your favorite restaurant place. So you go on a rebound to try and find that next great place that makes excellent Vietnamese food. And you end up at McDonald's. And there's nothing wrong with McDonald's, their coffee is a little too hot, but besides that, they do it. Wait, your your qualm with McDonald's is that their coffee is too hot. Yeah, and all the other. Did they get like sued for that? I oh, think they yeah. might. Yeah, they did. Wait, guys, <laughs> focus. We're doing great. We talked about pH. We talked about Cam and C four. Other questions you have? Chapter three. Yeah, what's that? I'm not going to answer broad questions. I want specific questions. Okay. Uh, is there is there a difference between isomers and structural isomers? No. Oh man, um, really structural isomers are a type of isomers. I don't think you need to remember that or memorize that. Um, the enantiomers. Wait, what? Like the, the enantiomers? No, absolutely not. Cis trans isomers. Oh, that doesn't. Well, those are the um, defenses. That's like what, uh, uh, yes. trans fats and yeah. saturated fats. Here's the only thing that I could ever expect you to maybe know for the AP bio when it comes to isomers. That I will always throw out more at you than the AP exam asks. But the AP exam is also predictable because they're scientists that worship golden cows. And <laughs> there's one person that wrote this textbook that loves isomers and the rest don't. Um, isomers have to deal with the same structural or the same yeah. chemical formula, different structure. These are called cis because they're sisters and they're on the same side. And trans isomers mean opposite sides across. So cis is same. And are uh, trans fats the same thing as the saturated fat? Oh. So um, a, let me try and answer that question. You'll see drawings of fatty acids in your textbook where you have a glycerol down to three um, fatty acid tails. Those fatty acid tails can have um, a bunch of single carbon bonds, which means they're straight, talking glue butter, or they can have a monounsaturated bond, which means they have one double bond, or they can have lots of them. These are things like olive oil or peanut oil. They're liquid at room temperature. They're not solid like butter or lard or ghee or my favorite suet, which comes from the fat that surrounds beef kidneys. It makes excellent pie crusts, especially around uh, the holiday season. Um, 
What scientists do is they want to make cheap cookies to sell in the vending machine, but they don't want them to go bad. So they take the olive oil and they saturate them in a bath of hydrogen gas, which breaks up the um, carbon bonds, basically makes them saturated, but it causes yeah, some abnormalities. Oh, uh, yeah, excuse me. <laughs> and uh, do we have to like, memorize any of the functional groups here today? No, nope, um, except for one that I think might be useful. The only one that I can imagine that I think is useful, not because of what it is or what it looks like, but what it does is phosphate. The more I teach bio, the more I realize that phosphate groups like rule the root. Two reasons why. ADP and ATP. What's the difference between ATP and ADP? One has one more phosphate group. Yeah, ATP and ADP, as we'll talk about more this semester, is basically a five carbon sugar bound to a nitrogenous base, and it has these one, two, three phosphates. And because the phosphates are all really negatively charged, um, there's a lot of repelling going on. It, it is, um, like, if I copy Beck t two more times and put the three copies of Beck in the same room, I don't imagine the three Becks would get along quite well. <laughs> would that be, am I fair in saying that, Beck? Yes. Yeah, I just feel like you would be fighting all the time. Um, or from what I hear, it'd be like you and Astrid in, in <laughs> a room talking about AP U.S. history. Oh, sounds about right. Is that, is that about right? Uh, not so much <laughs> AP US. Oh, oh some yeah. other things. But. Gotcha. I, I just hear stories about AP US history from Ben. <laughs> <laughs> I thought I thought you said that Beck and um, Astrid are like on or is it Luca? Yeah, Luca and Astrid. Okay, anyways, I hear things about AP US history and people fighting all the time. Anyways, the three phosphate groups repel each other because they're all negatively charged. So when you go down to ADP which is basically you remove that third phosphate group, you release a lot of energy. Why else is phosphate groups important? They do something else. We use ATP and phosphates all the time in one of our favorite things that we've learned so far this year. And it has to do with the game of time. Oh, phosphorylation. Phosphorylation of proteins during signal transduction causes things to be turned on. When you add a phosphate to a secondary messenger or a protein during cell um, transduction, the protein's activated. Why do you think? Adding a phosphate molecule with a really negative charge turns a protein on. Helps it produce more. Well, it adds energy. What are most molecules in signal transduction or signal reception? What type of pro uh, molecule are they? How much is that? Proteins. They're proteins, and proteins have very specific functions. Functions determine shapes. Ba shapes Charges. that determine their sh function. What determines the shape of a protein? Uh, the foldings. Yes. The yes. What what determines that? DNA codes for it, but why does the protein have a certain structure? Because the molecules the charges on the amino acids. On the amino acids, which we find in their what group? There are groups. There are groups. So we. This is, this is where we. I want you to take this review and not think about all the black boxes and like how all the this things like are. A combination of three steps. Right? You take the primary structure, which is beads on the string, then you get a nice alpha helix, and then all of the R groups start oh, interacting, and we get this jumbled mess of a protein. Isn't that like first and secondary? Yep, structure? first, secondary, tertiary. You add something. You add a phosphate group to this, and suddenly 
this inactive protein, based on the R groups interacting with this phosphate, whoops, become a whole different shape and structure. So what's the difference between tertiary and quaternary structure? Quaternary structure is if I take multiple tertiaries okay. and make a group out of them. Some good examples of quaternary proteins Red blood cells, your favorite pump ever, ATP synthase. Most receptor proteins, any protein that has multiple subunits or functional groups or does very complicated things, it's meant to be a quaternary structure. Red blood cell are proteins? Yeah, your red blood cell basically is an uh, uh, inner tube filled with proteins that can carry oxygen. Red blood cells have no organelles, and they have no nucleus. Wait, really? Really, they're denucleated. They only that's live for 120 days. They cannot divide. They contain no genetic information. They are just a protein vessel. There are also eight out of every 10 cells in your body. Wow. That's, and they don't have DNA because, like, so they don't get like, there's no viruses from, like, their DNA. Yeah, they don't have DNA because they don't need the room for it. Their their job is to be, it'd be like making your car a gas tank with wheels. Their job is just to carry oxygen. Anyways, phosphates change the structure of a protein based on the R groups interacting with the phosphate. Like turning on a robot. It's like C3PO in The Phantom Menace gets turned on when Anakin is showing Qui-Gon his cool new protocol droid. Flips the switch, it's on. Are you an angel? I guess that reference is still off that movie. <laughs> it's not off that movie. Yeah. It's just not, it's not like Except for the lightsaber duel. The lightsaber duel is amazing. Yeah. With Darth Maul. When you remember you're alive. Mm. Wait, so why does, um, why does changing the structure actually Oh, because, because, excellent question. Most, that's an awesome question, and I appreciate you asking me that. I'm going to just draw two proteins. This is going to chapter six. Here is an enzyme, and here is a substrate. Why will this substrate work with this enzyme and not this substrate? Because of the shape. Because of the shape of the two molecules that interact in this region here called the active site. The active site. And when the act when, when the active site has a substrate bind to an enzyme, we call that a ligand. Lock a key. ligand. It's a locking key, but it's a ligand. I thought ligand was just for self-division. I guess it's Ligand it refers to any time two molecules, specifically proteins, come together to form an interaction. Enzymes are the best example, but a lot of times transmembrane proteins form ligands with signal molecules when they bind to the receptor. So we, when proteins are activated, Lily, their active site generally opens up or becomes becomes different so it can interact with the next molecule. So it's basically opening the space for the molecule to then dock or to enter. So it like changes it in like a specific way. Changes it in a specific way. Okay. Doesn't just like mess with it. Doesn't mess with it. It's okay. I was just trying to draw this yeah, randomly yeah. to show that the change totally gets transformed okay. by that one addition. But that general shape is to make the active site turned on. We call this allosteric regulation, where a molecule binds to an enzyme or a protein, and it causes its shape to change, to become functional, to do something. Yeah? Wait, so every protein has an active site? Not every protein, but proteins that are involved in enzyme or cell signaling generally have an active site or a place where they can form an interaction with a ligand. Okay, because last year, after last week, I was in the same session all the time. 
Great example. Um, what did we learn about on Thursday? Beck, I need more candy. What were those uh, proteins called uh, that regulated mitosis? They're called cyclins, and cyclins needed to bind to CDK proteins in order to become activated. It happens to be that CDKs are cyclin-dependent kinases, which are enzymes, so there you go. There's a ligand in that spot. <laughs> Other questions? You guys are doing great. Yes, Rachel. Um, for chapter four, the first one, I can diagram and explain the role, structure, function, or different components of prokaryotic and eukaryotic cells. Oh, gross. That's a terrible statement. Um, <laughs> I wrote that, too. Um, <laughs> here is what I would generally feel confident about with bacteria versus eukaryotic. Okay? Not yet that important. We started to see this in mitosis. Bacteria don't have a nucleus, and they have a single strand of chromosome. They have a circular chromosome. They obviously have the ribosomes that make proteins. They might have a flagella. Sperm also have that. Or cilia which your small intestines also have, and also the hair cells in your ears. Cilia are responsible for moving in a coordinated mechanism in your ears, which transmit to neurons which allow you to hear. So you can thank your cilia in your hair cells for letting me hear all of my anecdotes today. Wait, so why do you, why do you the cilia in your small intestines maximize surface area to volume, oh, hello, that's so which allow them to absorb more uh, nutrients in your digestive system. We obviously have the nucleus with linear chromosomes in eukaryotic cells. We have this fun place called the endoplasmic reticulum. Which can be smooth or rough. or rough. Rough meaning the ribosomes are there. Ribosomes also appear in uh, the cell without the ER. We have the Golgi. I would say I don't care about intermediate filaments, but I think microtubules are important because that's how the vesicles get from one place to the next. And they're also really important for the host. And that's about it. Plants have chloroplasts. This is an animal cell. We could draw a mitochondria here. I would minimize your focus on just pure anatomical terms. AP bio still needs a few more years get away from the old AP bio exam, but basic anatomical memorization is not the key to getting a five on this exam. Used to be, thankfully it's not. Yes? Wait, so for cells that can grow like really big, do they just have more of each of the other ones, or are they just bigger? Because I know like some amoeba can grow up to like maybe like two inches. I did not know an amoeba can grow up to eight inches. I was not under that impression. I don't Beth, I don't know of any cell that can be eight inches. So eight inches is huge. That is a sandwich. That's bigger than most organs in your body. Where did you get this information? Is it really skinny or is it That's like so not. Maybe it's like it's eight millimeters or something. Beth, I can't believe eight inches. Yeah, it's not eight like inches. a football. Biggest cell. Biggest cell. Just look up eight inch amoeba. Um, most eukaryotic cells tend to be three to four times larger than a prokaryotic ah, cell. Ah, here we go. Well, it's not an amoeba. It's an aquatic algae called Calnerpa taxifolia. Um, and it's, it is a single cell that can grow to the length of six to 12 inches. Ah. So you can figure it. It's disgusting. I can't answer that because I'm not an expert on it. It probably means that they're very simple. They don't have a large metabolism. They probably have a lot Ooh. of proteins in their membrane to let things in and out. Why is it so tough?
You look very cozy. I know, furry legs. Yeah, the school is not well regulated. Um, this school is very much endodermic, or ectodermic, I'm sorry. <laughs> means that the temperature has nothing to do with the inside. It has everything to do with the outside. Um, other questions you have? I will answer everything and anything. I really like the question about the proteins and enzymes and actocytes because that sort of like puts different pieces together. Try and tell yourself stories as you take notes. How can I make connections? I I don't know more than you. I just have spent enough time learning this material that I can tell stories now rather than thinking about facts. That is the only difference between me and you. I'm a good storyteller. I'm an okay storyteller. That's a better way of putting it. Rachel, yes? Um, I can describe the benefits of the creation of this challenge as a land-based conservation of the fertility. Oh, man. We're going way back in time. Okay. Um, oh, Rachel, hard question. Um, this is chapter 43, chapter 43, based on when I got married, probably didn't get the do that it did. Um, so imagine this is a big piece of land that's forest. I remember fragmentation. I remember this. We were talking about the nat national forest here. Yep. So this is just a big old forest. Are you going to make that down? Yeah, I'm going to do some bad things to it. Now, we, to predicate this, because I want to tell stories, I don't I just want to go over the idea. We learned that the um, diversity of an ecosystem in terms of species or species richness really is in this Goldilocks level of disturbance. So if I were to never clear cut this forest or do any sort of disturbance to this forest, diversity would be quite low. Alternatively, from a timber company, and I make a row here, and I make a row here, and I make a row here, and I build a town for the people here, and here, and here and here, suddenly my diversity is going to be quite low for the complete opposite reason. What I've just done right now is create fragmentation, which means suddenly individual populations of, let's say, bunnies. We like bunnies. I'm going to draw the bunnies in pink. Bunnies can't get to other bunny populations. We are creating the conditions for the population size of the bunnies to go down because they can't effectively reproduce and obtain resources. One way to circumnavigate this are corridors. Corridors could be above road bridges or tunnels or restorative ecosystems that can help different populations get from one ecosystem to the next. Why does this matter? Who remembers the prairie chicken? Oh, I don't like, like the prairie that. chicken. It's going extinct. No, right? but it's because of the, the vortex. Illinois, the, the extinction vortex, where populations get smaller, so what decreases at the Gen same genetic time? Diversity. Genetic diversity, which means that they're less robust to further disturbances, so we create this vortex of extinction. So corridors can help little bunnies get from one bunny population to the next. And you know what they say about bunnies? They reproduce very frequently. Um, so by increasing the number of reproductive events between different populations, like green bunnies and pink bunnies, we can have <laughs> genetic drift go down. So the bunnies are a more robust population. So corridors, really good. Natural reserves, really good. The
problem, though, is if I'm a government and I get lobbied by people like Rachel to protect the bunnies. Rachel, I'm just picking on you since you asked me to do this. This might be my natural reserve for my bunnies. It's called Bunny Sanctuary. It's protected inside, but as soon as I leave this protected zone, I have roads and development and things that prevent my bunnies from really flourishing. It's likely that the size of my habitat does not really um, match the effective population that I need. There is a um, term called MVP. You guys remember what MVP stands for? Minimum, no, it's not viable, minimum, viable, minimum viable population. It's likely the minimum viable population of bunnies that I need to not have an extinction vortex ought to be all of this. But because governments have to balance economic development with conservation, all of bunny land doesn't exist. The effective size of a population is how many individuals are actually breeding. The MVP is how many we need for the population not to become extinct. Natural reserves tend to prioritize conservation, but they don't do a good job of creating boundaries. There is one country that the textbook alludes to that does do that pretty well. Costa Rica does a really good job of creating boundaries or transitional zones with varying levels of economic development, which tends to support conservation, development, and also people having jobs. No, they're not. I'm sorry, this looks like an absolute disaster, but I love the color palette. Go for it. So are corridors man-made? Corridors can be man-made. They can also be or natural. Okay. Corridors that are natural, like a... Um, I created a, a corridor with trees to help bunnies get across the road, or like a heavily forested, that's probably man-made or man-controlled, but it's more natural than just a bridge. We have a lot of corridors in Vermont for amphibian crossings where there's tunnels under the bridge or signs that say, beware of the salamanders. That's cool. Yeah. There's been talk about creating a wildlife corridor between Algonquin Provincial Park in Canada, which has wolves, and um, the Adirondacks. Um, New York has seriously considered reintroducing wolves because of the deer problem over in New York for a while. That could be one way of doing it. There's also talks of creating a more permanent wildlife corridor between Glacier National Park and Yellowstone to help the two grizzly bear populations survive. Yellowstone and Glacier are the only two places in the continental U.S. with grizzly bears. They are your turn. Not Cody yet. Still pretty big. You don't want to run into a bear that's the size of this table that could gnaw you. No. No, bears don't respond to that. I don't know. No. Um, other questions? Like, how big they are in the water? Oh, yes! Here we go. Someone knew that the, someone was going to answer it. Um, you can do the math. You did this math three years ago or four years ago. Here's N. What? That's not N. That's T. So, to determine big R and little r, we have to assume that populations live in a perfect world. Like E. coli taking over the world. They don't exactly do that, but we're going to make some assumptions. <laughs> Generally what happens is big R is just taken between two very small data points with a high level group, and it tends to just be n2 minus n1 over t2 minus, or t2 minus t1. This gives you your slope. Um, 
this assumes a pretty linear slope. We know that this is actually exponential growth. So there is a little bit of a fallacy in that. But generally, big R is just change in n over change in z. Little r is just, Ben, how do we feel about the salmon red with the blue? I think that's probably one of the best yet. Best yet, Ben really hates the black, uh, blue, the blue background, so I'm just trying to do this for him. Big R divided by N1. This essentially is asking, in this population here, how many new babies are we getting from each population? We call this the per capita correlation. This is just called the intrinsic rate of growth. And you better believe I'm going to give you these equations on Thursday. You're going to give them to us? Yeah, you get the equations to the AP exam. So, yeah. Hmm. Now, a couple of questions. Is this an R or K selected species right now? Arg, like a pirate. Um, it's R select because it, it's likely not experiencing what type of dependent growth limitation? Density. Density dependent growth regulation, which just means things like food and space and competition really aren't a problem. Disease, yep. But at a certain point, too many people, too many, too many peeps in the VIP club. So it always goes back. It always goes back to the VIP club. At a certain point, at a certain point, we reach K, which is called the carrying capacity, which means the population, if it keeps partying like it's 1969, is going to crash and burn. Um, I, I think the song like you're gonna party like it's 1969. It's, it's the summer of 69. Yeah, but you're thinking of the, the Prince song. I am thinking about the Prince song. Prince song. Oh, yeah, it's 1999. Hey, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> I was born in, I was alive in 1999. It wasn't as great as you would assume. No, I feel like I assume. So, what happens with this um, intrinsic rate of growth? is that it starts to slow down. And we start to see, as the population grows, the growth rate slows. This is more of like an avocado green. It's OK. At what point on this line do I see growth rate slow? 50%. At what? 50% 50% of k. You're right, k over 2. k over 2 is my inflection point, because at this point, there are more peeps in the VIP club than I probably ought to have. I'm going to be adding less and less per day. My growth rate slows. To figure out the growth rate of this, I got this. It's little r times k. This is times k minus n over k. Well, I was just going to do the k minus n, but you're right. We're really looking at what is our carrying capacity, what is our normal or our current population, and then we're going to divide by 10. That means if I have a carrying capacity of 10,000, and my population is at 10,000, my growth rate is going to be 10,000 minus 10,000 is zero. Now, would my growth rate be infinite if my initial population is zero? 10,000 minus zero divided by 10,000 seems like a pretty big number. Would my growth rate actually be the highest at the beginning of my population? Yeah. Well, you don't have anything to begin with. You're also not being able to the growth rate is usually going to be the fastest somewhere between um, k over 4 and k over 2. Because we're going to have enough individuals making babies, yet we're not going to have any resource depletion or competition. So somewhere in that second quarter of the graph is where things are really good. 
great time to invest in cryptocurrency. The stock market is never going to crash. <laughs> you definitely should buy that second house. You ever hear of NFT? Non. It's like yeah, non fungible token. I don't know. It's like, it's oh, like, right. Like, 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 like the rights of like a JPEG or something. Yeah. Ask Gary. Yeah, I've heard about them. They're Gary crazy. Before. Other it's questions. Like, We're not going to answer that. Have you heard of what a blockchain is? <laughs> yes. Oh, gosh. You guys are not. We started off having yeah, fun and now we're going fun. here. Um, a couple things. Um, Sure. I think it's easiest to think about this example with the carbon cycle. A reservoir is just a temporary or permanent amount of that nutrient in a specific state. That state could be solid, liquid, or gas, living, or non-living. Organic or non-organic. So a reservoir could be the amount of carbon in trees and plants and bunnies. And then the amount of de decomposition could be a reservoir or a flux. I'm sorry. And that goes into the atmosphere. For each biogeochemical cycle, I don't think you need to memorize the cycles. I don't think you need to know every aspect of them, but I think there's a few things to discuss. Harvey wants to draw all four of them as they pertain to what I think is important, but I can just separate them out. Um, when it comes to water, Couple things that are important. Um, most of the fresh water on the planet is stored in ice caps or glaciers, and it's mostly melting. That, in in turn, is making. Um, I'm just going to keep this uh, going. The amount of runoff every year is going up and up. Runoff is the amount of water, that's groundwater, that doesn't get stored in aquifers. Simultaneously, farmers and their infinite wisdom, it's not really farmers' fault, it's society's fault, um, are depleting groundwater like it is 1999. Um, the Colorado River never reaches the Pacific Ocean anymore. So we're depleting groundwater at a really high rate, mostly because we use a lot of water for animal uh, products. Um, thirdly, precipitation is really erratic right now. I mean, who do you think's gotten more snow this year? Washington, D.C. or us? The answer is Washington, D.C. Washington, D.C. has had two snowstorms over 10 inches in it. We have not had that yet. So precipitation, in terms of where it's occurring and how much is occurring, is changing quite a bit. Parts of Washington had 40 miles of the interstate closed over the weekend because of excessive rainfall. And in other places, we're not getting any of the rainfall we need to. Those are three places where fluxes and reservoirs in the water cycle are changing. Um, CO2 is easy, because we teach it, but we're not doing anything about it. Um, the big thing is fossil fuel. And that is doing two things. It's obviously increasing carbon dioxide levels in the atmosphere. But then in terms of the ocean, about... 50% of all CO2 dumped into the atmosphere goes into the ocean, which is causing hydrogen ion levels to go up. Which is killing all of the plankton in the ocean that need a non-acidic ocean to form their exoskeleton. Yes? How does uh, hydrogen ion 
concentration increase in the ocean. Oh, CO2 because when CO2 carbon. goes in, CO2 interacts with this molecule called calcium carbonate. And there's some fancy math that happens between calcium carbonate and carbon, one of which is the release of extra hydrogen ions. Calcium carbonate is the thing that coral reefs use to make their structures, but it's very um, susceptible to acidic environments and CO2. This is why if you took one of your teeth out and put it in a bottle of Coke, there's a lot of CO2 in it and some acids. That tooth would be gone in a couple of weeks. And the tooth is calcium. And the tooth is calcium carbonate. So the calcium carbonate is being leached out of plankton Oral due to the CO2. Um, couple things for the other two nutrient cycles. Um, nitrogen, the big one with nitrogen is runoff. So all of that water that's not being discharged that we usually apply as manure gets run off because of shallow roots or degraded soil, and that causes algal blooms. I believe you learned the word eutrophication. Oh yeah, I remember that. It's good stuff in class. Nitrogen is found as N2 gas. It's 70% of our atmosphere, but plants can't use it, which is why we need bacteria in the soil to nitrify it. Humans have learned how to make nitrogen fertilizer without bacteria. 50% of the world is fed from artificial fertilizers. If we got rid of artificial fertilizers, 50% of the world would start. It's not great. It's not great. Um, phosphates, same thing. Fertilizer, algal runoff. Generally, nitrogen impacts oceans, and phosphorus are things like lakes. The bad thing is that while nitrogen gas is inexhaustible in our world's atmosphere, there's only a few places in the world that have usable phosphates, one of which is a mine in Morocco. We are running out of phosphates. Most phosphates that run off into the lakes fall to the bottom and sedimentize, and we can't get to them. Why do you think we need phosphates? For ATP. For ATP, you're darn right. We need phosphates for ATP, and we need nitrogen for amino acids. We obviously need carbon for things like glucose. So, you know. If life could be expressed by macromolecules, carbon cycle is for glucose, nitrogen is for amino acids, the phosphorus cycle is for ATP. Other questions? Okay. <laughs> I'm getting tired. I've been here since six, so I might call it soon, but I will answer any more questions you have. Yes? Wait, so what did you do with the coral reef like mine and phosphorus? Like we did it. You can apply guano or some types of poop, but I mean, we only hit a billion people in 1930, I believe. So what we did was we didn't have more people. Can I'm asking, can you find phosphorus and phosphate in like your food? Oh, yeah. Okay. You get phosphorus and phosphates right. from trace amounts of anything, it's in soil. It's just that in order to support 7 billion people oh. with the land that we need, we need to mine a lot of it. Same thing with nitrogen. If we got rid of artificial fertilizers, 50% of the world's people would suddenly not have food. So our, our food system, those of you who are in 11th grade, this is an interview that you're taking apes with me next year, is like based off some significant lies that we're telling ourselves when it comes to nutrient cycles. We are running out of water. We are using way too much carbon. Nitrogen isn't exhaustible, but it's still in our oceans, and groundwater pollution from phosphates is a big problem. Like Lake Champlain, in some parts, is considered 
basically a toxic waste zone. Based off on it's based on all the elements. We have three times the amount of dissolved phosphates in Lake Champlain that the EPA says is our maximum range. Because we are spreading a lot of output on degraded soils to make a lot of corn for a subsidized product that not many people buy. But I don't want to sound like Mr. C. Go for it. Um, what what's like the carrying capacity for nuclear bombs? You learned this in environmental science with me, but generally, if don't we kind of like? I mean, humans have a ways of like avoiding each other, right? Yeah. We're not avoiding it. We are, we are buying insurance policies that are going to run out very soon. Um, but we've developed ways to like resist disease and stuff like that. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so every, just assuming from what I've read, carrying capacity of humans right now is roughly three to four billion. Um, if you make that value representative of everyone on the planet live like America, it would be about 1.8 billion. Um, if we wanted to make everyone's lifestyle that of a developing country, it might be 5 to 6. That is to say, right now, someone in Bangladesh making our clothes for a couple hundred dollars probably has a lifestyle that exceeds the carrying capacity on a per individual basis. Meaning if all of you suddenly became the impact and lifestyle of a Bangladeshi t-shirt worker, we still would have too many people. What's the lifestyle of this? What? Uh, 800 to 1,000 dollar GDP rather than a 50 to 60 thousand dollar GDP. Probably a tenth of the CO2 emissions, probably a tenth of the meat consumption. Definitely doesn't own a car, definitely doesn't own a house, might rent an apartment. Yes. Yeah, well, there's a right. Why aren't we all dead? It's, it's like, <laughs> it, it was feels... happening. It, yeah. it, it will. It is solely yeah. happening. I mean, I don't know which of these is going to break first. I mean, this this is we're still a little uncertain about this. But this is a this is a big concern for me. The bigger structural issue is going to be the oceans. We are dumping a lot of energy into oceans, which makes storms a lot stronger. Like, then there's two billion people that live near the coast. So when the oceans get angry and get a lot higher, we have a huge migration issue. Let alone, on top of that, the other 1.5 billion people that will be displaced due to collapse. So you're talking about maybe 50% of the world's population needing to leave where they live based on ocean or droughts. Other questions? Now you got me excited about apes. I'm really excited about it. Thinking about like all of the big problems. Do we learn about nuclear energy? A little bit. We'll talk about the different types of energy in terms of things. I'm actually watching HBO's Chernobyl. Great miniseries. Might make apes watch it next year. Oh, it's like fantastic. That makes you think of nuclear energy in a bad way. Well, no, nuclear. It's nuclear energy or any energy poorly implemented. Hello, Jordan. I hope you enjoyed this. I can answer.